Hey everyone, thanks for watching. We are trying to do this internationally. I am in Taiwan and Greg is somewhere on the East Coast. And we're gonna tackle an interesting topic today and just hope the internet gods are behaving. How are you doing this morning, Greg? Good, Michael, good to see you. Yep, happy Chinese New Year. Oh, I appreciate that. Uh, Gong hoi fa choi, as they say, or, or uh, I probably said that really bad, but I tried. <laughs> So uh, there will be a little bit of delay, I'm sure, in this one. So we both apologize, but uh, we're going to make it work for you. And, and Greg, I think I think the topic today is let's talk about what each of us were doing in 2006, which most of us can just agree on was the last real estate peak. And then we'll transition into what are we doing today? Do we see the same things or not? So, Greg, what were you doing in 2006? So I had sold everything, including my first major company, and I was doing um, just some straight real estate development deals, building some uh, spec houses, getting into some other ventures, building a restaurant uh, chain, things like that. So I had uh, divested myself of all real estate. We saw the peak. 0405 was the peak of our market. Just trying to you know wait it out, see what was going on, and then jump back in mid to late 2007. Okay. So you, so you, you made a prediction, a bet, you saw the peak and you, you got, you got out, went to cash. Oh, four, oh five, sold everything, got on the sidelines and just kind of, you know, took a more opportunistic approach and was very cautious. Wow. That, that uh, was a very, very good call. Uh, as for, uh, as for Olivia and I, we had no idea the peak was coming. We just simply knew we couldn't buy the next house. And uh, we started doing a bunch of 1031 exchanges. It happened to be amazing timing, right? Take, take fake equity from a house and move it into multifamily. Uh, so we, we did quite well for ourselves, but uh, I, you know, I'm not sitting here telling you I, I knew that was coming. So uh, we, we got lucky. It sounds like you, you had a plan. So that was pretty awesome. Yeah, it was easier to spot on my end because, you know, I'm a developer. So I was building and selling, buying and selling, developing, you know, subdivisions. I had a couple of subdivisions at the time and, you know, things like that. So it was easy to spot from that standpoint because properties started sitting on the market for sale signs were popping up everywhere. Interest yeah. rates were on the rise. It was really easy to kind of see, you know, there's something going on here. And I didn't know exactly what was happening. But I just knew we we we're maxed out, so it was a good time to just liquidate, kind of kick back, and uh, you know, see what was going on. So that was kind of a first semi-retirement, if you will. Very, well, very very cool. So I am very curious about this next question. So we're sitting here, let's call it January 2020, and, and is Greg seeing the same kind of things? You're liquidating and getting small, or, or what's Greg doing these days? Yeah. So again, I'm, I'm opportunistic. So I'm not looking at anything long-term right now. I'm very concerned about number one, rent controls in a lot of areas. Um, I mean, there's new legislation now in some areas where they're even going to eliminate uh, background checks for renters. Um, so I think that you might see a push there. Um, cap rates are compressed in a lot of areas. So I'm, I'm very cautiously optimistic. I'm very opportunistic and you know, taking the approach of shorter term, I just don't know where things are going in the long term. There's a lot of development in the pipeline, a lot of things going on. You know, the economy's good, things are robust, people are spending money, but there, there's going to be an oversupply. Um, the prices of the assets are, you know, overly inflated in every asset class. Uh, and, you know, the price you pay for something is permanent, right? When you buy a property, that price you pay is permanent. The financing is what's temporary. Mm. So, you know, rates are low right now. I don't see a catalyst for interest rates to rise anytime soon, only to get, you know, low, lower, we're going to, you know, are going to get tighter and tighter. Cap rates are going to keep compressing. So I'm just not a buyer at average prices right now in any asset class. I'm opportunistic. It's got to be a deep discount or I'm just, I'm just going to wait. Okay. And so when you look at this and you say, wait, I think when you talked about 06, you waited about two years. Are, right. you, are you kind of seeing the same time horizon this time or, or you're just not sure? It's a different animal this time because of interest rates. Last yeah. time, that was the other thing. Interest rates were going up. So it was really easy to see. 
And I wrote a bunch of articles and did a bunch of interviews back pre-2004-5. And I said, watch interest rates. If we get over 5%, the train's coming to a stop. And that's what happened. This time around, we don't have hyperinflation in most areas, you know, a little bit, you know, and especially in the multifamily sector, everybody's after that. So you're seeing the most hyperinflation in that, in that type of property. Some commercial properties have a lot of competition, but multifamily is the biggest one right now. Everybody's flooding into the you know, multifamily storage, mobile home parks. Everybody's after those assets. And they might get lower. So that's the difference this time that I'm just not, I, I just don't know how that unwinds, if that unwinds, and when that unwinds, unless we see hyperinflation in the retail side of the, of the economy, meaning gas, food, clothing, things like that. Um, when those things start shooting through the roof, uh, you know, then we're going to see the Fed put the brakes on and start raising interest rates, but then the market's going to tank. So they're going to have to come back. You know what I mean? It's kind of like this catch 22 that nobody knows how to get out of it. Yeah. So it's interesting you bring all this up on rates because I just did a bunch of research on Switzerland and I did that for two reasons. First off, Switzerland's, you know, a first world country with the lowest home ocu home ownership rate. It's like 39%. So 61% of the population rent and they have huge rent controls and all the things you would imagine sort of forcing that. Then I looked at it and they just, they've had negative rates for about a year and a half. So negative 0.75%. So you're paying to keep your money in a bank. But what's happened is the big funds, insurance funds, hedge funds have basically turned to become builders because that's where they're chasing the five or 6% return on basically being a landlord. But now all that product is coming online and now they have huge vacancies and rents dropping. So it's, it, it just feels weird, right? So I, I had no idea that negative interest rates could lead to, a, I guess, a bunch of construction and cause values and rents to fall. I mean, I just didn't see that. Was, does that make well, sense? Well, that's why, uh, oh, absolutely. And, you know, I had lunch with a friend on Friday and we were talking about, um, you know, the interest rate environment and the development side of the business. And, you know, you got to remember developers make their money on the fees. So mm -hmm. deals are going to happen for fees. There's a lot of development in the pipeline right now because the banks make their money by putting the money on the street, pension funds, hedge funds, investment funds are looking for yield. So as long as we, you know, right now we have these projects coming out of the ground, we're not in the lease up phase yet, which we're going to be in the next two to three years. So then, you know, to your point, you know, anytime you have oversupply, then everything else changes. So, um, you know, Blackstone did the same thing in Spain, you know, when, uh, mm -hmm. when they had a housing market crisis, they went in and started buying up a bunch of houses, turned them into rentals. And, you know, that worked out really well for them. Um, you know, in this country we faced in 2009, 10, all builders were oversupplied in housing, right? I mean, there was communities that had thousands of homes that were sitting vacant or slabs poured that, you know, got taken over, converted, or just got completely abandoned. We never did quite work back through that inventory again. The builders are much more conservative right now. They're not putting thousands of houses out there on spec. They're generally building to the demand. But at some point, you're going to reach saturation. There's going to be, you know, every house that wants to be bought is going to be bought. You're going to have too many houses on the market. The big thing that concerns me about rents, you know, there's always going to be a need for housing. And rent, rent is a great space to be in. But the um, income to rent ratio is not going to stay evenly paced as we go along. Incomes are not rising equally in multifamily space or rental industry for, for residential, people say rents double every 10 years. Well, that's not always true. It may have happened, you know, 50s to 60s, 60s to 70s, whatever, but they haven't doubled in the last 10 years, right? In most areas across the country. And more importantly than that, incomes do not double every mm -hmm. 10 years and they're not doubling on, a, on that pace right now. So when you think about being, you know, a landlord or being, you know, owning rental property, you got to make sure you understand people can only spend so much of their income on rent. So what you should be watching more than anything else is income growth, individual income growth more than anything else. That should be your main in terms of what's going to be the health of my portfolio, you know, moving forward. Uh, that's, that's awesome. So we both shared with what, what we saw in 06, what we're seeing now. I guess the question now for somebody watching this, let's assume 
let's assume they're going to be a small time landlord, more like me than you, right? Their, their houses, duplexes, quads. What, what would you, what would you suggest for someone like that? You know, do we just scare them out of there and, and they're going to go back and play in the stock market or what would you tell someone ah. like in at the, the residential space, uh, trying to get their first or second rental today? Any, any thoughts? So, you know, when it comes to rental property, you can pay as much as you want, as long as you're getting the return that you're looking for. Now, um, in rental property, uh, generally been a, uh, a game of equity. So you raise equity in a couple of ways, enhancing the income and paying off the debt. Mm -hmm. So for most people, rental properties were an annuity. They didn't care if they made any money along the way. What they wanted was a renter paying off that mortgage. So in some point in time, they owned a bunch of properties free and clear. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> that's where the original, you know, how to become a millionaire in real estate, one house at a time. There was a book written years ago, how to make a million dollars in real estate. Mm -hmm. And it was the one, buy one house, read, you know, then do another, then do another. And it was a long-term play where you had all these houses that you owned free and clear after a certain period of time. And there's a lot of strategies out there for creative financing to do that. So as long as the house pays for itself, as long as you can hold the house where it's at and absorb a bit of a decline and you're not banking on the, um, then that's a safe bet. And if you're looking for properties in areas where you can't build new inventory and people want to be, you're generally going to be okay. So there's going to be pockets where you see the trouble is when we start getting out into the outskirts of these areas and you start throwing up all this excess inventory, assuming population is going to continue to grow. People are going to want to commute, you know, do those types of things. Those are the things that you see start to contract and have trouble first, but the urban centers, the city centers and the areas right around them are the ones that generally seem to hold uh, because you know, it's built out. So you can't develop new, there's not a lot of new inventory and there's always going to be demand to be close into where people are working. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think any place in the you know real estate landscape, single family homes, a residential product is probably the safest place to be uh, for a couple of reasons. One, you talked about builders being smarter, right? Not throwing up thousands of homes. So inventory is constrained. In fact, it's lowest since 1982, which is when they started counting it. So pretty good, right? right? Uh, and rates are lower than they've ever been. Again, good thing. And job prospects are pretty good. So uh, I think being in the residential space of all of them is the place to be. I could, I wouldn't touch multifamily today. It's, it's, or, you know, storage or any of that, you know, other stuff. It's just, well, again, there is an equity cash flow, but you are going to pay your debt down along mm -hmm. the way. So if you, so if you're looking in, looking at it for long term, you're fine. You know, yeah. you, you get a multifamily property finance for 20 or 30 years and you know you're just paying that mortgage down so you have assets that are free and clear so it's more of a long-term play or it's a roll-up play okay mm -hmm. so what you want to do is you want to add value in the portfolio not the assets so the value you add is now in building a portfolio of assets not in the asset itself oh very cool very cool all right so as we wrap this up any kind of closing thoughts uh, on our weekly conversation I think uh, the interesting thing to watch now is income growth. So keep an eye on that. That gives you a good indication of the buying power of the consumer because we are a consumption economy, consumption-based economy. We are no longer producing. We're consuming. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are being consumed by the world. They're consuming our goods. So the other thing to watch is um, debt to GDP. And even Powell, last time, he, is, he can't figure this, you know, doesn't know the answer to this. What happens to the United States when our debt outpaces our GDP? And we're very close to that. In other words, when our debt payment and the service on the debt, national debt, that we're borrowing money from all these countries, buying our bonds, buying our debt, when we no longer produce enough to pay that, what happens? Mm. So that's a big bomb right there that nobody seems to know what happens, when does it happen, and how do you unwind that? Yeah. Oh, never boring. Never boring. I want to thank yeah, you. For, it's interesting. Thank, yeah. Thank you for giving us a shot. Love talking about 06, 2020, what's going on. Uh, congratulations on calling 06 or I guess 04, 05. And uh, thanks for sharing with what you're doing today. It's, it's always fun catching up with you. Yeah, absolutely. Same here. And, you know, for everybody listening, don't be scared. Get out there and do deals. Just be smart about it. Make sure you can weather a downturn and be prepared for a downturn. May not happen. I don't know. But, you know, as long as you're ready for it, you're in good shape. There you go. All right, man. Thanks. Have a wonderful day. Thanks again. Yep, you too. Yep. Bye.